finishing up this morning uh, our Sermon on the Mount series, Hill to Die On. Uh, it's been a joy and a privilege to, to teach a few times in this series, as it's one of my favorite chunks of scripture. Um, and I pray that you have uh, gotten as much out of it as the Holy Spirit's intended for you. What a difficult chunk of text, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Um, and going all the way back to the first week of this series, which I, I taught uh, and I suggested to you, and I hope that I, I've been proven right by the way that you feel, is that the Sermon on the Mount is, is quite radical. It's earth-shattering even. And, and I said it in the first week that really if, if, you, if on an initial observation of Matthew 5, 6, and 7, if your biggest takeaway isn't that these words are earth-shattering and what they say and suggest and mean for you, it's not that... Uh, they aren't, it's that you're not coming to them correctly. And then even more so, and I'll say this one more time, we've really been uniquely blessed to live and grow up, most of us, in a part of the world where much of how we perceive the world, how we perceive truth is shaped like ideas seen in the Sermon on the Mount. The idea uh, that humility and love is to be strove for. The idea to love your enemies and to not continue to heap judgment upon people in their places of hurting is an admirable trait. Uh, these are things that Jesus uh, introduced in a revolutionary way that had not been seen in philosophy and faith and thought. And so I'm excited to finish us off today. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 7, the very, very end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 28. And so I'd invite you to go ahead and open to that or uh, go in your Bible app to Matthew 7, verses 13 through 28. And that text will be up on the screen. And as you turn there this morning, uh, we're going to do things, I say somewhat different, but, but not really in a sense. I've told people before, and I had it said to me quite a few years ago, I can't remember who said it, but Reading scripture can be one of two different things. It can be like uh, evaluating wine or it could be like drinking water, right? And if you ever are around somebody like a sommelier or somebody who works in the restaurant industry, you'll hear these guys, these really fancy guys in TV and movies, well, they'll take a sip of wine and they'll swish it around and then they'll spit it out and they'll, they'll talk about the soil that the, wine, that the grapes were grown in and they'll say, oh, I can taste the storms that came through the Mediterranean in that year. And this vintage is so special because there was a war fought at that time and you can taste the iron from the bullet casings, right? But when people drink water, they do it to stay alive. And I'm, I think most of you know, if you have been around Element, I love approaching the teaching of God's word and evaluating it and talking about historical context and talking about the wars that were fought and what the, what's the soil that this word grew up in, right? But sometimes, and maybe more than we're willing to admit, we just need to drink it like water. We need to take in as much as we possibly can. And so that's what we're going to do today, because in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 28, there's about five or six sections of Scripture that could each be a sermon in and of themselves. And so for someone like me to, to do a flyby like we're going to do today, it's very difficult because I want to stop and give you detail after detail. But the Sermon on the Mount is not like just any sermon. Remember, and I shared this, and I think the other guys have shared this a few times, right? Jesus would have sat down uh, on a hillside there in Israel 2,000 years ago, and his disciples would have gathered around him, and he would have shared these teachings. And like I said, these teachings were earth-shattering. They were monumental. They were revolutionary. They were radical. And this is not a sermon where Jesus finished, went and stood at the door, and each one of you went and shook his hand and said, nice talk, preacher. And then you went to Big Dave's, right? I appreciate the encouragement, right? I appreciate the pat on the back, knowing that you might have extrapolated or learned something from what we do up here. But what Jesus did is he changed the world. So what happens at the end of a sermon that changes the world? Well, people change. Because for the world to change, people have to change first. So I'm going to ask you a lot of questions today. I'm not going to say a lot of grandiose things. Most of it's not going to rhyme. Not sure any of it's going to start with the same letter. And the only thing that's going to be up on the screen is Bible verses. But there will not be one single rhetorical question this morning. What I mean by that is every question I ask you, I want you to answer in the quiet of your own heart and mind. If you don't, 
If right now you're saying, I don't care what the preacher says, I'm not answering anything. I'm not letting God speak to me this morning. While we're reading this text and you begin to get a foretaste of some of these topics that we're going to talk about, some of the questions that I might ask you, I'm going to pray for you and I want you to join in praying with me for you that the Holy Spirit might now begin to give you the, the transparency and the vulnerability to allow the Holy Spirit to evaluate the inner workings of your heart and mind. This is a room where your works really don't matter today. We're all here. We all get the gold star for attendance. But what matters is your heart. And that's the point of the Sermon on the Mount. So the major question I'm going to ask you today, before we even read this text, is if Jesus meant what he said, what changes for you? We're in a room in a part of the world, in a time in history, where it's super easy for all of us to stand up and say, yes, preacher, I believe Jesus meant what he said. That doesn't matter. What matters is what changes because of what he said. And if somehow, some way, and I've been here, you've been here, some of you are there right now, somehow, some way, you can come face to face with Jesus, read his words, hear his words, and walk away unchanged, I hesitate to say you've met the same Jesus I've met. Because he's absolutely changed me. None of you knew me before I met Jesus, and thank God for that. You wouldn't listen to my sermons. I was a freshman in high school, and I was the biggest idiot that you had ever met, right? You would have never let me be your youth pastor. You would have never let me be your kid's youth pastor. Because Jesus changed me, though, right? So if Jesus meant what he said, what changes for you today? And that's how we're going to start off. So Matthew 7, verses 13 through 28, I want to invite you to stand as you are able in the honor of reading God's word. This is right after Jesus gave what we typically call the golden rule. So he continues on. He says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but are inwardly ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree... That does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand." And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Verse 28, and when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority, and not as their scribes. And this is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I pray that we would all be astonished at your words this morning, that our jaws would drop at the authority in which you speak. And for those of us who know exactly what that authority means, Lord, that we would continue to be changed, we would continue to become more like you. But Lord, I'm certain that in our midst, whether in the room or online or even watching a recording years after uh, today, there are people who think they know you or who know that they don't know you but have been acting like they do, or, Lord, there might be someone so broken in our midst who has come here today hoping to hear something that might change their life, and, Lord, boy, are they in store for something, not because of my sermon but because of your sermon 2,000 years ago that changed the world, and so I firmly believe it can change us. And so, Father, we just give you everything we have to give, and we pray in the name of Jesus that uh, nothing we do here would be about me 
or element or a person here, Lord, but it would just be to give you honor and glory and praise because you are the only one do it. And so, Father, we give it to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our King. Amen. All right, you can be seated. So if Jesus meant what he said, if Jesus meant what he said in that chapter, in that passage, in, in everything else, what changes for you? I mean, if I, if I just said that, Randy, we, we could be done, right? But he, but he makes it difficult for us. He, he puts us in a position, Josh talked about this on stage a couple weeks ago. I think he was doing announcements about how everything that we do here is about getting us to a fork in the road. And Jesus routinely does that. He starts off in verse 13 and 14 and says, Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it are, by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. It's no doubt that when Jesus said these words, he, he was likely thinking of Psalm 1. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. See, Jesus is the crux, and that word crux literally just means cross. Jesus is the fulcrum. Jesus is the lever by which every human is judged. Your life rises and falls on the name of Jesus. Jesus routinely makes a habit of bringing us to a fork in the road, and tells us to choose. And so in this description, he says there's a wide gate and an easy way that leads to destruction. How humorous is it now that in our world, when we think of the way of Jesus, when we think of the gospel, we are led to sometimes believe that that is the wide gate, that that is the easy way. But that's not how Jesus describes his own teachings. Because on the wide path with the wide gate, there is plenty of room on this path for people going in whichever direction seems fit for them. That gate is wide enough to where you don't need to leave anything behind before you start your journey. You don't need to leave your pride. You don't need to leave your opinions. And you certainly don't need to leave your sin behind. But in the path that enters by a narrow gate, only you can come through. Right? So it is the difficult way, the narrow gate in the hard way. It's hard because it has marked boundaries that we must follow. Humans don't like boundaries. Right? So it's interesting uh, that Jesus, when he describes his own way, he would describe it two different ways. The one we see here where he says it's hard, it's a narrow path with a narrow gate, but elsewhere he says that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So it would seem that these two statements are contradictory. But they're not, because the, the easy yoke and the light burden come on a path that is marked by boundaries with curbs and sidewalks and signs that tell you where to go. This is God's revealing nature that he's making quite clear to us what he wants. But we see, we live in a world now, we live in a world now where the most desired path is the wide one, with the wide gate. And you can have whatever opinion you want. You can determine what your truth is. Jesus says, few people are going to choose the narrow path. This doesn't mean, I mean, we, we see other visions in Scripture of the heavens and, and all of us in it, and he talks about the grand multitudes that can't be counted. So this doesn't mean we are an elite special few. But what this means is that when pitted with the choice to follow the wide and easy way or the narrow and difficult way because there's boundaries, because there's, there's um, expected standards, that most people will do what is easy and desirable in the eyes of sinful men, and that is to follow the desires of their heart. And the heart is deceitfully wicked. I grew up in the 90s. I was born in 1988, just turned 34. All right. I did, like, I did a wedding yesterday for two kids that were in sixth and seventh grade when I became their youth pastor. So I'm in a bit of a crisis right now, actually, right? But I grew up in the 90s, and if you watch TV for an hour at least in the 90s, there was a commercial that came on that made you, it doesn't matter if, if, if you were 
uh, probably a, a, a rough guy, like a really manly man or whatever, but every single kid in the 90s wanted to be a United States Marine because of these commercials, right? These guys would have these commercials of this guy climbing a rock, and he'd get to the top of the rock, and because he had performed this huge feat of masculinity, he would stand up straight, and from the bottoms of his feet to the top, he would get this brand new uniform, and he'd be standing there sharp, and they got swords, and I was like, I want a sword, you know? And I remember watching this, and I was like, man, this is the baddest fighting force on the face of the planet. Some of you, I know, I know Jim was a Marine, is a Marine, sorry, there's no past tense when we talk about Marines. There's probably quite a few of you, yeah. But these commercials made me want to go through three months of boot camp. I bet you it wasn't like the commercials, right? No? <laughs> the other thing, though, is all the recruiters would come to my high school. So you'd have the Army and the Air Force and the Navy, and I came from a Navy family, and then you'd have the Marines, and the, the Air Force guys would be telling you about college credits and job training. The Army guys would be talking about uh, the 1st Infantry and, and all these things. The Navy guys would say, oh, you're going to see the world. The Marines didn't want you to join, it seemed. They were like, ah, you probably wouldn't make it anyway. <laughs> so I was a wrestler, and me and all my buddies, we were like, oh, we'll show you. you know. Oh, there's a, there's a hard path? There's a difficult path with a narrow gate? That's for me. Jesus isn't trying to convince us not to do it, although eating flesh and drinking blood is hardly a recruitment commercial. But what he's saying is that the easy path gets you something less than desirable. But it's the hard path that gets you to a special destination. It's my boundaries that keep you safe, despite your less than freedom. And we live in a world that says, no, it's freedom that makes you free. It's lawlessness that makes you free. And in a society where we prize law and order over everything, many of us, when left to our own devices, spiritually, resemble anarchy more than governance. So I want to ask you, second question of the day, which path are you walking? It's not rhetorical. Evaluate your life right now. Which path are you walking? Some of you, I'm sure, are on a path right now where, if you were being honest, is the path of destruction. And you are making decisions based off of what feels good for you, what sounds good to you. Which path are you walking? Verses 15 through 20, we'll continue on. He continues on, he says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. The fact that he says, Beware of false prophets implies a couple different things. One, there will be false prophets and false teachers. Jesus is telling us right away. We see them show up by the time Acts rolls around. There's false prophets and false teachers like five minutes after the resurrection of Jesus. We still have them today. But because there's false teachers, we can also infer another thing, that there are true teachers, that there are some teachers who are professing and teaching truth. It's no mistake that this instruction to avoid false teachers comes directly after the wide and narrow gate discourse, as false teachers are uniquely skilled at blurring the lines of the most important issues. False teachers, the most effective ones, the ones that you might not realize are false, are the ones who leave enough truth in the core of a lie that it looks like truth but brings about death. It brings about an entrance onto the wide path. We, our world is full of false teachers. But Jesus says you will recognize them by their, by their speaking skills. You will recognize them by hell. Guess what? False teachers, so much more eloquent than true teachers. Because true teachers are wrestling over their words. True teachers are, are, are judging themselves by a standard. True teachers are holding up the counsel of God's word and saying, I need to conform to what I see here. False teachers get to say whatever they want. Whatever is going to get your money. Whatever is going to get your allegiance. Whatever is going to get your attention. They are ravenous wolves, and Jesus says you will recognize them by their fruit, and good fruit does not come from unhealthy trees. So I say this 
as someone who is in a position of teaching and authority more than you likely even realize. My entire life, I feel like sometimes, is speaking authoritatively on God's word. So I take no joy in saying what I'm about to say. You are to judge me by my fruit before I judge you by yours. This also means that false teaching is not the only thing that makes one a false teacher, but false character and false morality. And boy, do we need to hear that. Most of the men and women in our world that are false teachers today are not false teachers because their teaching is bad, but because their character is evil. Most of the false teachers uh, that are, are, are false teachers, are heretics, are leading people astray, their preaching is so much better than ours. But they're cheating on their wives and they're stealing money from ministry. They're lying. They're exaggerating the stories in their books, all to make you glorify them and to fall for their tricks. So now we flip the tables, right? If you're sitting under good teaching, then you then are subject to being judged by your fruit. You are being, if you have, if you have roots in good soil then, you have the responsibility then to be evaluating your life and your fruit. What fruit is coming from your life? And what soil are your roots planted in? Not rhetorical. What, is, what makes up the soil of your life? What nutrients are you taking in spiritually? Are you good soil? Or are you the rocky soil? Or are you amongst the weeds? Or are you the soil that has just enough depth to where a seed can germinate and pop up a little bit of fruit just to get by another Wednesday night? Enough fruit just to make it to camp. Enough fruit just to make it through another small group. Enough fruit just to make it through. But then the, the, the fruit, the, the plant shrivels up because the roots are never getting into the soil. And what fruit are you producing? Is your life made up of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control? If you look at that list in Galatians, do you see yourself at all? It's not a hard question to answer unless you're being dishonest, unless you're being prideful, unless you are not willing to look at the mirror of Christ. So what soil are your roots planted in and what fruit are you producing? Verses 21 through 23, the heat gets turned up just a little. Because he says, enter by the narrow gate, not by the wide. And then he says, beware of false prophets who would lead you to the path of destruction. And then in verse 23, he looks ahead to judgment day and says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then, Jesus says, well, I declare to them, I never knew you. I never knew, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I want to preempt teaching on this passage by being in youth ministry for seven years and then now being uh, in the positions that I'm in now. I've seen this passage cause so many people an existential crisis that leads them to question their salvation. And that's not why it's in scripture. It's not there to make you insecure, right? But it is there to provoke you to evaluate, are you doing this just in name and in motion only, Right? Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, that the word there, Lord, in Greek is kurios, and I only point that out uh, because in Romans 10, and if you were part of our Element University study uh, this year in Romans, you learned that in Romans 10, 9, Paul instructs the church at Rome uh, that to be saved, you must confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord or kurios, and believe in your heart that Christ raised him from the dead. Now, why this is hugely integral in the church in Rome especially, but even the church at Alexander Mills, right, is that in Roman culture, you only used the word kurios for one person. 
and that was Caesar. Caesar was essentially a demigod. He was just a slight step lower than, than, uh, than the gods. And so Caesar was Lord, right? And it was a divine uh, label for whoever was in that office of Caesar. So it was horribly countercultural in the church at Rome to say Jesus Christ is curios because that was implying he was higher than Caesar. But now there were also Jews in the church at Rome too. And as you likely know, the Old Testament that we have, the Protestant Bible, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. That was the original language of the Old Testament. But during Jesus' time, most Jews actually read the Old Testament, at least if they were to read it outside of the synagogue, in Greek. Greek was the most common language of the day. And when the translators translated Hebrew, and the word for Lord there would have typically been something like Adonai, they would translate Adonai, Lord, as kurios. And so to a Jew, the idea of calling anybody other than Yahweh, Kyrios, was blasphemous. And so in the church at Rome, you had Jews and Gentiles, and both groups would have been horribly offended at the notion that anybody other than Yahweh or Caesar was Kyrios. So when Paul says, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the Lord, it doesn't mean what the Southern Baptists of now mean. We use the word Lord all the time. But back then, that word was heavy. But that's not even the most radical statement there. He says, unless you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Now, I talk about this all the time, but he's not talking about the, uh, the organ that pumps blood through your your, your body and, and reoxygenating blood and all these things. He's talking about when the Bible says heart, it means the innermost part of yourself. If you believe in your heart, the innermost part of you, the thing about you that makes you you, if you believe there that God raised Christ from the dead, you will be what? Saved. What a word that we have absolutely stripped of its meaning in our world. Because to be saved in modern day American Christianity, all you have to do is walk an aisle. All you have to do is pray a prayer. All you have to do is good works. All you have to do is wear a cross necklace or get a sick cross tattoo or listen to Maverick City. And in a few years when they're old, somebody else will take their place and we'll start listening to them. Right, And all you have to do is do whatever necessary to be part of this club. But no, you do not need to confess Jesus Christ as curios, and you don't need to believe in the innermost fabric of your being that God raised him from the dead. Not that he turned water into wine, not that he walked on water, not that he healed the lame man, but that God raised him from the dead. He says, some of them are going to say, Lord, Lord. Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do all these mighty works in your name? This should, by the way, this should kind of scare some of you because your worldview has no room for this phrase. Many of you have likely sat under my teaching for, for long enough where you've heard me talk. There is a part of our world that is unseen that is just as real as the physical world, you can smell, taste, and touch. It's a spiritual part of your world. And it's just as real, if not more real, than the observable world. And in it, there are spiritual beings. I know this is good. I'm going to lose some of you here, I think, okay? But in it, there is a war going on. In it, there is very real warfare going on for you. And the enemy is not dumb. He wouldn't have made it this far if he was. He's very deceptive. He's very manipulative. He is, the Bible says he's wily. He's smart. He's attractive. That's why sin is so attractive. So some of you would be shocked to find out that all throughout Acts, people perform miracles under power other than Jesus. 
If you're familiar at all with the history of war, even just human wars, it makes sense that the enemy in trying to trick you to follow a false teacher would allow one of his demons to be cast out, to trick you into following that person. So these people there on judgment day are saying, didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we prophesy in your name? Look at all these mighty works that we did. Once again, humanity loves trying to save ourselves with works, but Jesus stops and says what is some of the most earth-shattering moments, words in all of, in all of Scripture. He says, depart from me, for I never knew you. Many of you know, I, I study world religions, I teach world religions, I travel around to see what the rest of the world believes, and what I have burning inside of me is this truth for you, is that not everything that works is good. Just because something works, Ouija boards work. Other, other religions work. They will do things for you. There are magicians in Acts who perform miracles. Not everything that works is good, but everything that is good works. Everything that is good works. Prayer works, but not according to your will. Fasting works, but it doesn't make you a god. It doesn't get you closer to enlightenment. It makes you more like God. And it makes you listen to him more. Community, fellowship, works. But sometimes it'll break your heart. It'll convict you of sin. And in a human-designed faith system, there would never be conviction of sin. So listen, next question. In a world where it costs, in our part of the world, and I'll never grow tired of saying this until it's not true, we live in the easiest geographic part of the world and in the easiest time in history to be a Christian. That is changing. But it isn't changed yet. So in our part of the world where it costs us almost nothing to call Jesus Lord, have you forgotten to actually make him Lord? Have you forsaken to actually make him Lord? Do you, in fact, live your life however you want? Or are you, like Jesus says, the one who does the will of my Father who sent me? Are you judging your life by a standard or by your desires? Next question, have you determined what is true for you simply by determining what works for you? Nothing makes my blood boil more than hearing people say, well, this is true for me. That's a foolish statement. And the only place you'll find it is on the wide path with the wide gate. Who cares what is true for you? What's true? Verses 24 through 27, we get a very famous teaching that the wise man builds his house upon the rock, foolish man builds his house upon the sand. All of you know the song. I'm not going to sing it. But what I think about a couple years ago, I was at the beach with my family, and my entire family uh, looks for shark's teeth at low tide. Um, I just can't see them. I literally can't see them in the sand. So I just sit and play with, with, play with whichever kid doesn't want to look for shark's teeth at the time. So I'm sitting in my chair, and it's low tide, and as happens at Curie Beach on low tide, the tide goes out, and it's almost like these little islands pop up out of the low tide, right? There's these little sandbars, and there's this little boy on this sandbar, and he had built up a pretty, pretty cool little sandcastle, and you could tell that this kid, probably about eight, nine, or ten, he, he felt like a king. He was like, I have my own private island, and no one can come on it. And his little sister was trying to mess around, and he was kicking her off, go find your own island. And I was kind of sitting there, and because I'm a pastor, everything's a sermon in my brain. But I was watching, and I was just like, boy, is that boy going to be upset in six hours? <laughs> and we laugh. But that's how some of y'all's lives are today, is you are the king of your own private island. But when the tide comes, it will wash away. And I'm not saying I'm above this because, man, I've been there. But some of your lives fall apart every five days. I'll read, I'll read the words. The rain fell. The floods came. And the winds blew and beat on the house. Some of you, every time the wind comes, 
your life falls apart. Every time the waters rise, your life falls apart. Every time the wind beats upon the walls of your life, it is destroyed. Some of you, your life's pretty solid right now. And you have mistakenly bought into a lie that it is built upon the rock, but it's actually built upon the market. It's built upon your marriage. It's built upon the security of a job. It's built upon a self-esteem that is wrapped up in your ability. And one day when you are old and feeble, you will not be able to do what you were once able to do. Some of you, your, your self-value and the house that you've built yourself is based on your appearances. And one day you will not look like what you look like right now. Some of our, some of our uh, self-worth, some of the kingdoms we've built are built upon our intellect. But I am already forgetting the facts that I knew 10 years ago. How foolish of me to think that I am the king of my own private island because there's an intellect there, but it is washing away. Next question. What are you getting your security from other than Jesus? What are you getting your security from other than Jesus? Your marriage? Your kids? Your job? Is it here? Is it this? Does, it, does this make you feel so good that it fuels you up Monday through Saturday and then you come back the next week needing fuel to make it through? That's not what this is. The island will wash away. So what are you getting your security from other than Jesus? And then verses 28 through 29, Jesus finishes what, in my opinion, is one of the most radical sermons, speeches, sermonettes, whatever you want to call it. And he says, and when, and when it says, and when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. I've said it before, but that word astonished has somewhat lost its meaning in our world today. We might be astonished at a magic trick, you know. We might be astonished at somebody who's horribly talented in some ways. But I'd like to suggest to you that really what likely happened is what we would call their jaws dropped. You know, we've all been there. Some of you have likely been to a concert or maybe a, a sporting event where you were so amazed that you would have described to somebody, I, could, I couldn't move. My jaw was on the floor. And that's how these, these Jews, that's how these followers of Jesus felt when Jesus finished what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And so, like I said, there was no handshake. Hey, good TED Talk, preacher. All right, but we got to cut out for lunch. They probably sat there in silence and were just like, what just happened? He changed everything. So I want to ask you this question that I tell my students at Gardner-Webb, that I tell people that I teach here and everywhere else, that when you are trying to evaluate the worldview of a group, whether that's a group with a different religion, a group from a different place geographically, and I'm going to ask you today, I'm going to evaluate your worldview today like I evaluate the worldviews of other, of other faiths and cultures is, what's the highest authority in your life? If you go somewhere else, or if you meet somebody who's not a Christian, ask them that question. It's, it's actually super fascinating. Because you find out a lot about a person when they honestly a- answer the question, what is the highest authority in my life? And so for non-believers, you know, you might get something like my family. You might get something like, well, whatever's going to make me most comfortable, whatever's going to make me happy. You might get one of those wishy-washy, my truth answers. But I am not foolish enough. I'm foolish quite often, but I'm not foolish enough in this moment to think that every single person in this room is going to answer that Jesus is the highest authority in their life. But here you are on a Sunday morning in a church with a cross on it, singing songs about him. Why? Because you have never, ever stood at the fork in the road of the narrow gate with the narrow path and the wide gate and the wide path and chose the narrow gate. You think you have, but you haven't. And your, your roots might be in good soil, but there is no fruit. Maybe you've bought into false teaching. Maybe you've given into a truth that is less than God's truth and looks an awful lot like your truth. What is the highest authority in your life? Pleasure? Convenience? Success? Happiness? Some of you might even say the Bible. 
But that's how we get legalism. The Bible is not the third part of the Trinity. The Bible is hugely important as God's revealing nature has given it to us, but it is a signpost for us to actually know a God who wants to know us. So is the highest authority in your life God? And if not, I want you to consider making that happen today. Because salvation is confessing with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, which we can do here. You can't. There's an altar here in a few moments. JR and I will be standing up here. There might be others, that, if necessary, who come up and pray with us. And so there might be confession of, with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And maybe some of you today, through the power of the Holy Spirit and regeneration, will be utterly changed to the point where you do believe in the innermost fabric of your being that God raised Jesus from the dead? Some of you still have questions about that. We serve a God who loves your questions because he has all the answers. All right, so let's talk if you're not ready. But Charles Spurgeon used to give these huge revivals. He's the, one of the greatest modern-day preachers in, in the history of preaching. And they would ask him. They would say, how many salvations today? And he would say, I don't know. Ask me in six months. I am tired of counting salvations based off of confessions. Salvation is steadfastness. Salvation is consistency. It is being planted where you're at, growing and producing fruit over time. And so many of us have been saved and baptized five and six times because we are waiting for magic to happen in our life to conform us to the image of Christ that we see in God's word. And we've never actually gotten our hands dirty in the business of sanctification, of becoming like God. And you are blown about by the winds of this world because you have no roots and your house is built on shifting sand because you are the king of your own kingdom. And so Jesus' declaration of independence in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' Magna Carta, his constitution of a new kingdom with a new king comes in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, where he says over and over and over again, it will be different when I am your king. It will be different. And so fast forward now to this beautiful imagery. And uh, we don't, we probably should plan these things, but it just keeps happening where on the day where we're doing communion, the worship team, team sings a song called communion, right? But Jesus gives these words, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And as much as I love these words, as much as I love this sermon, as much as I think that they were absolutely earth-shatteringly different than anything else that had ever happened in history, they would have meant nothing if not for this. Jesus would have simply been a guru if not for this. He would have simply been a rabbi if not for this. Because a couple years after the words of the Sermon on the Mount, on the night of the Passover, Jesus goes into this room with his, with his disciples. And as many of you know, they're celebrating their yearly observance as Jews. In, right before the exodus out of Egypt, God uh, brought death upon the Egyptians because of their merciless rule of the Israelite slaves. And God says, I will spare the Israelites if you take the blood of a spotless lamb and mark it over your doorway, death will pass over your house, and you will be able to leave Egypt, leave slavery, leave bondage. And so Jesus, in the midst of celebrating this uh, most important of Jewish holidays, takes this bread, and he breaks it. And he looks at his disciples, and he says, this is my body. And what he meant by that is, I am now the spotless lamb of the Passover. I am what is going to save you from death. And he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and eat. And he said, take this and eat. And as often as you do, do it in remembrance of me. And then after the meal, he took the cup and he blessed it and gave thanks. Gave it to his disciples to drink. And he said, this is my blood shed for you as a sign of the new covenant. And once again, what he means by that, he says, I am now the spotless lamb of the Passover, whose blood you will mark over the doorway of your life. And because of that, you will be spared from the darkness of death. Take this and drink, and as often as you do, do it in remembrance of me. And the next day, he would be killed, and his body would be broken, and his blood would be shed, because he is now our spotless lamb of the Passover. And we are spared 
from a merciless bondage of death and slavery because of it. And I want to tell you, none of the words of the Sermon on the Mount would have meant anything if not for that body and blood. He would have just been a guru. He would have just been a rabbi. But now he's a savior. And saved from what? From our sin, from you, from the darkness that we all live in naturally. And he's calling you out of it right now. So what we're going to do in just a moment, and man, I got teary-eyed in the first service because for about two and a half years, we haven't been able to do it the way we're going to do it this morning. And man, that styrofoam is the worst, right? But we're going to come here in a moment, and you're going to line up at one of the stations near you. There's two up here, one in the balcony and one in the back. Line up together with your family. If you're not here with your family, line up with some friends. Um, If you're by yourself, that's perfectly fine. And take the body, take the bread. And even though Kim and Butch, who so so wonderfully and consistently serve us through preparing this, what an honor that must be to do that, they break it. But I want you to break it. And husbands, fathers, I want you to lead your family in this. I want you to take your families and break the bread and give it to them. And I want you to look at this, and I want you to say, thank you, Jesus, for your broken body, that I can be healed. And you're going to take it before, uh, before you leave the station. You're going to dip it. This doesn't soak up uh, quite as much juice as, as the, uh, the leavened bread. But take it and say, thank you, Jesus, for your shed blood. And before you take it, and even if before you line up, I want you to honestly allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you about some of your answers to the questions that I've asked you today. Because this is not, some, this is not just a ritual that we do to make you feel good. This is the entry point. Each, like your baptism is the beginning and this is the continual. And so if there's repentance necessary in your life, repent. If there's conviction in your heart right now and you're confused, I want you to hit your knees, come pray with somebody and ask the Holy Spirit to evaluate your heart and show you what needs to change. Show you what needs to have light in a dark place and then come. Use this as an opportunity to repent. When I tell you that the whole world was changed by this sermon, I'm not lying. But none of that matters if you're not changed. And you can be today because Jesus was risen from the dead.